Okay, I'll get started. Wanted to begin with a second reminder about test two. Test two is exactly one week from now. Test two will cover all the materials since test one. That's on magnetism, induction, and um, what we'll be doing in today's class and the next class. Uh, test two has exactly the same format as test one, so you're going to get the ten uh, true false questions worth 20 points. You're going to get the uh, three long problems worth uh, uh, 80 points or 80 percent. Uh, here's a list of all the material on test two. Is these? Uh, is it eight lectures or seven lectures? Um, uh, the formula sheet is online in our Canvas modules directory. The practice test is online in our Canvas modules directory, and you'll go through the practice test on Monday's recitation. Any questions on all that? Okay, then I'll get started with the class. One week ago, we introduced induction and Faraday's law of induction. In the last class, Tuesday's class, I said the law of induction incorporates two effects. It's quite an unusual physics equation in that it incorporates two phenomena. In the last class, we talked about one of those phenomena where it's the law of induction when you have uh, moving components, moving parts. In this class, we're going to be talking about the law of induction when you don't have moving components, you don't have moving parts. In the last class, the law of induction was really like an a, a instruction manual for how to build electrical generators, and we did that in class, um, how to build electrical motors. Uh, we didn't do that in class, but um, an electrical generator turns uh, energy of motion into electrical energy, and the motor does the reverse. It turns uh, electrical energy into energy of motion. In today's class, we're going to talk about the other effect in Faraday's law of induction. Um, it's the effect without moving parts, where there are no moving parts. And it's, and it's really the, uh, the manual. Faraday's law there is a, a manual for wireless communication. And uh, wireless communication, like electrical generation, like electrical motors, is an incredibly important technology in our modern day lives. OK, so today, here are the things I'd like to get through. I'm going to talk about uh, induction with moving parts, talk about, in this case, what we call transformer EMS and transformer currents. Uh, I'll explain the word transformer in transformer EMFs and transformer currents. Uh, we're going to talk about a quantity called an in, a, a, a component called an inductor and a quantity called an inductance we'll see that they're similar to quantities, uh, a quantity or a component that we called capacitance and a quantity that we call capa capacitance. So we'll be discussing that. Um, we're going to look at the uh, time scale for energizing and de-energizing an inductor with a certain inductance, like we looked at the time scale for energizing or de-energizing a capacitor. So we'll see the similarities there. Um, and just to stress, you know, wireless communication, we use it all the time. So I've listed some examples here of wireless communication. You know, when I upload the 128 steps that I did in a day, uh, I might be using Bluetooth. Uh, when I'm using my laptop, I might be using Wi-Fi, my phone cellular. Um, if I'm in my old car, then the only electronic device I've got is an old radio. Uh, if I'm uh, cooking, <laughs> I'm using the microwave. All those are sources of wireless communication, every one of them. And they're all based on the law of induction that we're discussing in today's class. The, 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 
the case of the law of induction when there are no moving parts. They're all wireless communication. Okay, let's get on with it. So I'm going to start with talking about um, uh, wireless communication between two circuits where one electrical circuit talks to another electrical circuit or vice versa. And then actually we'll move on to what might seem a strange case. Um, it's where one electrical circuit actually talks to itself. So self-talk between a circuit. And they're both actually examples of, of, of kind of wireless communication. And so those are the two cases we're going to be looking at. We'll start with the, the two-circuit case. And so this is the situation I'm thinking about. And we're going to uh, think about Faraday's law of induction in this, in this context. I got a circuit over here on the uh, left-hand side. And I've got a circuit over here on the right-hand side. The, the circuit on the left-hand side contains this, um, this coil, coil of wire. Uh, and the circuit on the right-hand side also contains a coil of wire. So they're, they're similar in that sense. In the circuit on the left-hand side, what we're going to do is switch that circuit on or turn that circuit off uh, with this switch here. At the moment that we um, switch that circuit on or turn that circuit off, this coil creates a changing magnetic field, a changing magnetic flux. And so um, if, if we were to imagine the moment that we close the switch and complete the circuit, the, this magnetic field suddenly appears. And I'm picturing the field lines here. Uh, if we were to imagine the moment I open the switch, this magnetic field, where I picture the magnetic field lines, this, uh, this suddenly vanishes. Uh, so the moments of opening and closing the switch, which correspond to moments of um, switching on a current or turning off a current, create um, a changing magnetic field and a changing magnetic flux. This circuit over here on the right responds to that changing magnetic field, that changing magnetic flux. And in this circuit on the right, at those moments we're closing this or opening the switch on the left, we see um, uh, little induced EMFs, little induced currents in the, um, the uh, current meter here or the voltmeter here. And so these two circuits are literally communicating with one another. They are literally communicating with one another through the, um, uh, not through wires, but through empty space and, and through uh, this, this effect that we call induction. Um, the, the whole route from the left-hand side circuit to the right-hand side, side circuit is that we start by on the left changing the current in the circuit. We switch it on and switch it off. That creates a changing magnetic field, a changing flux, and it's that changing field or changing flux that creates the induced EMF in the uh, right-hand circuit. So if we were to think about what we did on the left-hand side and what we saw on the right-hand side, what we did on the left-hand side was change the current. And what we see on the left-hand side is we see a corresponding voltage. And the more, the faster we change the current, the greater the voltage we see. The, the slower we change the current, the smaller the voltage we see. And this would wor work in reverse, too. In, in our sketch here, we imagine that circuit number one on the left is talking to circuit number two on the right. But circuit number two also talks back to circuit number one in the same in a very similar way. So if you were to change the um, current in circuit number two, the one on the right, that would induce a EMF, a voltage in its circuit number one on the left. So um, we've drawn one example of circuit number one communicating with circuit number two, but also circuit number two could communicate with number one. It's kind of a mutual communication, right? Just like some, some humans. Right? We mutually communicate with, with one another. That's not happening right now, um, but it could be. Right? You could talk to me and ask me a question. OK. Now, we've actually seen an example of this 
what's called transformer induction, when you don't have moving parts, um, uh, when you change a current in one circuit and you produce a voltage in another circuit. We, we, we have seen an example of that one week ago, and the, and the, the voltages that we induced were, were really rather small. Uh, the currents were really rather small. But actually, in induction, you can make extremely large voltages, extremely large currents uh, through induction. The way to make extremely large voltages, extremely large currents, is to change the voltage in circuit number one, the one that's doing the talking, change the current in circuit number one, change it very quickly. If you change it very quickly, that's a very fast change in magnetic field, a very fast change in magnetic flux. It, it creates a large voltage, a large induced current in the other circuit, the one that's being talked to. So the way to shout in um, uh, wireless communication, the way to shout in wireless communication from one circuit to the other circuit um, is, to, is to talk really fast. If you talk really fast, then you create a large induced current, a large voltage in the other circuit. So it's all about the rate at which you change the current in, or the voltage in the circuit that's doing the talking to create a large, uh, a, a large disturbance in the circuit that's experiencing that talking. Uh, I can show you a demonstration of that. Let me, uh, actually, let me change the slide. I'll show, oh, I have changed the slide. Didn't even know I did it. Uh, over here on the, on the far left is this arrangement here. So this is two circuits. Um, I've got one circuit that's a large coil here, and it has a relatively small number of turns. So it's got 10 turns. And as you can see it over here, you can see the 10 turns on the coil. And then I've got another circuit it's a, it's a long solenoid. It's actually got a thousand turns. And the, the long solenoid is in red here on the uh, demonstration over on the, on the, on the right. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, in, induce an EMF, induce a current in the solenoid between the terminals of the solenoid uh, by uh, changing the current that's flowing in the coil, in the coil of 10 turns. And to make the effect really big, what we're going to do, the key thing is, as I said, to shout loud in electromagnetic induction, what you've got to do is change the current, or change the voltage very rapidly. So we're going to change the current, change the voltage very rapidly. In this particular case, we're going to change it at a, uh, change the current, we go like on to off, in actually, 10 millionths of a second, so 10 microseconds, we're going to switch a current on. And we're going to switch it on and off and on and off every, about every 10 microseconds, so about every 10 to the minus 5 of a second. So that's a tiny, tiny interval, a very, 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 very fast switching on and off of the circuit. This means that this coil will shout loudly at this solenoid because the rate of change of the flux, the rate of change of the field is very large. We're going to induce a large voltage between the ends of the, um, the solenoid. We're going to induce, actually I wrote down 100,000 volts here. We might be uh, producing about half a million volts between the ends of the solenoid. And so we're going to see if we can see that. Okay, so I'm going to switch this thing on. And um, so that's just plugging it in. Uh, there is a foot pedal to switch it on. There's a foot pedal because you can't get too close to it. Because we are going to make close to a million volts. I'm going to turn the lights out so we can see, see the effect a little better. Um, you notice on the two ends of the solenoid, there's two horns coming out. Uh, those are the terminals of the solenoid. And it's between those two terminals that end in these two little spheres that we're going to produce this close to a million volts 
by changing the voltage and the current in the coil very, very rapidly, switching it on and off every, um, every uh, 10 to the minus 5 of a second, every 10 microseconds. So, so let's see if we can do this. So that is close to a million volts. I can only do it very quickly because it will break. And so you can create a huge voltage, a huge current by induction. There's no connection between these two devices, right? There's no wires between the solenoid and the coil. It's purely the fact that I'm rapidly changing the current in this coil over here, the large one, where you see the 10 turns, I'm changing the current there, I'm changing the voltage there, that induces a um, changing flux, magnetic flux, changing magnetic field, and, and that produces, induces the induced EMS, the induced voltages in the solenoid, and that gives us this, this huge spark like lightning, which is the breakdown of air. It's literally the burning of air. The air is being ionized. Okay. Okay, so let's do a little example calculation to check we understand what went on there. Um, this is a very s similar setup. It's not exactly this setup, but it's very similar setup. I've got a, um, a, a, a solenoid and a coil. And um, in the text there, I'm describing the details of the, the solenoid in the coil. I'm looking for my pointer. I've lost it somehow. I have no idea where I put it. Here. I realize there's a typo on this slide. The, the text is correct. The pointer didn't even work. This text is correct. This should be 1,000 turns. And this should be t 10 turns. I, I don't know what quite went on there. Um, so we've got a 1,000 turn uh, solenoid. It has a cross section of 0.1 square meters. It has a length of one meter. And that's placed uh, inside this coil here. And this coil has a, um, uh, a cross section that's one square meter. And it has 10 turns. And so this, is, this text here is information about the uh, outer coil, how many turns we got there, 10. The inner solenoid, we got 1,000 turns there, and the, and the geometry. And we're told that we turn on in the solenoid a current of 5,000 amps, and we uh, switch it on in 10 microseconds, so 10 to the minus 5 seconds, and we've got to find the induced EMF. And so that's, the, that's the, the question here. As I say, these two numbers are wrong. I'll change these in the slide. It's, it's 1,000 turns in the solenoid, and it's 10 turns in the, uh, in, the, in the coil, which is exactly what we have over here. We have 10 turns here and 1,000 turns in the solenoid. OK, so let's see if we can work out the uh, induced EMF in, in this situation. Uh, I'll do this on the document camera. So how does all this happen? Uh, it, it happens because there's a changing current. We switch on the 5,000 amps in the solenoid. That creates a, changing, a change in magnetic field. And we'll figure out that change in magnetic field in the solenoid. That creates a changing flux, creates a changing flux through the uh, coil. And that changing flux through the coil creates, uh, that then creates the induced EMF. So the route to finding the EMF is, what's the change in current? What's the change in magnetic field? What's the change in flux? That'll tell us the um, induced EMF with Faraday's law. So let's do those, those steps. Um, the change in magnetic field. Well, the, the change in magnetic field is the change in the magnetic field of the solenoid. If you remember that 
the magnetic field of a solenoid is given by the, this equation here. This is the simplest way we can write it. It's mu naught, the magnetic permeability, constant in nature, times n, lower case n, which is actually the number of turns per unit length of the solenoid. So it's how tightly you pack the turns on the solenoid, Turn, times the current in the solenoid. So a very simple equation for the magnetic field in the solenoid. Um, we're fortunate, uh, well, I, I remember the uh, magnetic permeability is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, and the units are teslas, meters over amps. The number of turns of our solenoid, number of turns of our solenoid was a thousand turns, and that thousand turns is along the length of the solenoid, uh, which was one meter. And so that's the number of turns per unit length. It's actually a thousand turns per, per meter because the solenoid was a meter long. And then we, um, we switched the current from zero to 500 amps. So the changing current, uh, really I could have written this as the changing current, is 5,000 amps. And so if I multiply all those quantities together, then I get uh, 6.3 teslas. 6.3 teslas, very large magnetic field. So we're, with this large current, we're making a very large magnetic field. Um, and, and critically, we're, we're switching it on and off very fast. So this is the change in magnetic field. Now we want the change in magnetic flux through the coil that is um, surrounding the solenoid. So let's figure that out. Uh, that would be, remember flux, flux is the product of the magnetic field, the area over which that field is, and the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector. In this case, like many cases, the, the, the magnetic field lines are perpendicular to the cross-section of the coil, and so the angle between the vector B and the vector A is going to be zero degrees, it's going to be cosine of zero degrees, it's going to be one. So our flux would be B A times a cosine of one, but that's the flux through each turn of the coil. There were ten turns of the t coil, so I'm going to, going to multiply by the number of turns of the coil, so M B A. Uh, N, the turns of the coil, not the turns of the solenoid, this is the coil now, is 10. Um, the magnetic field strength, that was 6.3 teslas. And finally, the um, cross-section. This is actually, this is an important step here. This is not going to be the cross-section of the coil. We are figuring out the, um, the flux through the coil. So you might think, I want the area of the coil. But the the magnetic field is only inside the solenoid. It's only over that little area inside the solenoid, and so we just need to use the, um, the area of the solenoid. So I'm going to multiply here by the area of the solenoid, cross-sectional area of the solenoid was 1.1 meters squared. And so if I multiply all those things together, I end up with, uh, what do I have here? I've got a 10 and a 0.1, so I'm actually going to get 6.3 again is 6.3 Webers. That's that funny units of flux, magnetic flux. Okay, so now we know the change in magnetic flux. Um, I should have, again, I, I meant to put a delta B, delta B in here. This is the change in flux. It's due to the change in magnetic field, which is due to the change in current. So that I was really meaning to use all these deltas here uh, because we're just working our way through from a change in current to a change in flux. Uh, now I've got the change in flux, I can use Faraday's law of induction, the law of induction to find the, the change in um, the, the EMF that got induced. So that's just the change in flux divided by the interval of time over which that flux occurs. I'm just worrying about the size of the flux here, um, and so I'm just going to put in the, the, the size of the flux change in the, the time interval here. So uh, 6.3... Webers divided by that time interval was the key thing was this really short time, 10 to the minus 5 of a second, 
And um, if we divide 6.3 by 10 to the minus 5 of a second, we get 0.63 megavolts. So it's 6.3 times 10 to the 5 volts, or, or 0.63 megavolts. So it's more than half a million volts that we just generated in that arrangement there. That explains why we got that big spark. That voltage was so high, like a, you know, like a thunderstorm can break down, ionize the air. This, this voltage here can uh, break down and ionize the air. Okay. Here's a little quiz question. This came up quickly. Um, so let me, let me uh, post this. This is about a similar effect, you know, two circuits talking together. Um, but this, this is a question not about what is the induced EMF, not about what is the induced current, but rather about uh, what directions, what are the relative directions of the currents that are induced uh, when two circuits talk to one another. So in, in this example, we've got, a, we've got this outer loop carrying a current, uh, and we've got this uh, inner loop, this rectangular loop here. Uh, one's a loop of wire and one's a solenoid, but the point is that there's an outer circuit and there's an inner circuit. Um, we change the current in the outer circuit, so we're increasing the current in the outer circuit in this counterclockwise direction. And the question is, what direction does the current in the inner circuit flow as these two circuits talk to one another? So we're changing the current here. We're changing the flux. We're changing the field. Uh, we're inducing an EMF in this circuit here. Um, what is the direction of the induced current in that circuit? Okay, so I'll give you another minute or two. So this is a question about right-hand rules, about Lenz's law in the law of induction. So if we increase the current in this outer circuit in this counterclockwise direction, so that's what we're doing. This current here going in this counterclockwise direction is growing. We could use the right-hand rule. I'll go through all the steps here. We could use the right-hand rule, curl our fingers in the direction of that current. That's counterclockwise. Here I go. My thumb is pointing in the direction of the field that's created by that circuit. So that circuit is creating a field where the field lines are coming out of the, um, uh, out of the screen in, in the center of that circuit. And so that's what these little green dots are, or teal dots. They're, they're the magnetic field line that are coming out of the screen due to the increasing current in this circuit. Well, the law of induction, Lenz's law, within the law of induction, says that the induced currents, induced EMFs in the circuit in the center that we're talking to, 
they will, they will have a sense or have a flow which is such that they'll create an induced magnetic field that's opposing the changing magnetic field. So if we're creating a field that's coming out of the board, the current in the coil in the center, the square coil, will be such that it will create a field into the screen. So the square coil now, I'll try and make my fingers a square, um, the square coil is going to create a field in the opposite direction. It's an opposer. It's always opposing. Um, so it's creating a field into the screen. So my right thumb is pointing in towards the screen. My, my fingers here then tell me the direction of the, um, the current that makes that field in that coil. And, and now my um, fingers are curling around in the clockwise direction. So if you increase the current in the outer coil in the counterclockwise direction, you're going to create a current in the inner coil in the opposite direction. It's the, it's the clockwise direction. So they oppose one another. The currents oppose one another. The changes are opposing one another. And, and that's, that's an illustration, example of Lenz's law applied to this wireless communication. Okay. I want to talk about what might seem a strange thing. You know, if I talk to myself, that might seem a strange thing. Circuits talk to themselves. It may at first seem a strange thing, but we're going to see how it actually works. So this is transformer induction. It's induction without moving parts, but it's not with a pair of circuits kind of mutually talking to one another. It's with a single circuit talking to itself. How does all this work? Okay, well, this is a picture meant, in, meant to show you the idea of transformer induction for a single circuit. So uh, I got three pictures here, but it's three pictures of the same circuit depicted at different moments in time, depicted at different instants in time. Uh, over here on the uh, left-hand side, this is th this circuit, which is really a solenoid or a coil of wire. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there's a current that's flowing through the coils of wire, and uh, that's creating a magnetic field through the coils of wire in green here. Uh, but that current is is not changing. It's not varying. And that magnetic field is therefore not changing, not varying. The magnetic flux through the coil of wire here is not changing. In that case, right, because there's no changing magnetic flux, there, by Faraday's law, there would be no induced EMFs, there'd be no induced currents. But supposing Supposing I was to increase the current in the coil of wire. That's what this middle circuit or sketch is describing. Um, or supposing I was to decrease the current in the wire. That's what this right-hand sketch or, or, or diagram is describing. So these are the, on the center and on the right, these are the cases of if I happen to increase the current in the circuit or happen to decrease the current in the circuit, what's going to happen then? If I increase the current in the circuit, that's going to increase the magnetic field inside the coil or solenoid. That's going to increase the flux, magnetic flux, through the coil or the solenoid. And that's the ingredient, that changing magnetic flux through the coil or the solenoid. That changing magnetic flux is the ingredient of Faraday's law that says that you're going to get an induced EMF and induced current. So if we increase the current through this circuit, it will induce a current, induce an EMF, actually in itself. So it talks to itself through Faraday's law of induction. Likewise, if we were to, on the right here, if we were to decrease the current, lower the current, that would lower the, um, correspondingly lower the magnetic field. That would lower the magnetic flux through the turns of the solenoid or the coil. That, again, is an ingredient in Faraday's law of induction. If you're changing by decreasing the flux uh, uh, through this circuit, you're going to induce an EMF. You're going to induce a, a current in the circuit. 
And so these two examples in the center on the left are where a circuit induces an EMF, induces in a current in itself when its own current changes. Uh, it, over here on the right, when we're decreasing the current, we induce an EMF, we induce a current in itself when it decreases the current. So changing, changing currents in a circuit always sort of talk to themselves. They influence the circuit by creating their own induced EMFs, their own induced currents in the circuit. Every circuit does, does this. Every, it's interesting when you start thinking about it. Every circuit talks to itself. In your iPhone, all the circuit components, they're all talking to themselves because every time something in them changes, a current or a voltage in them changes, it induces currents and voltages um, in themselves and in the neighboring components. So everything's talking to itself and to its neighbors in an iPhone or any other piece of electronics. They t as we said, they talk more if the currents change faster, the talk less if the currents change slowly. So that's an important ingredient. But at some level, everything talks to everything else, including itself. OK. Uh, there's a law. And there's a property or a quantity that describes this, um, what we call self-induction. If I'm an electrical circuit and uh, my current is changed and I induce an EMF, I induce a current in myself. That's called self-inductance. Uh, the inductance between two circuits, our first example where circuit one talks to circuit two or vice versa, that's actually called mutual inductance. So one's the case of kind of friends, the other's the case of you know, you're at home on your own, you're talking to yourself. So self-inductance is talking to yourself. Um, and um, uh, self-inductance the self-inductance of a circuit uh, with itself is described by this little relationship here. So if you look at this formula here, it defines what we mean by self-inductance, this thing that's given the symbol L for some reason. Um, it's the proportionality constant between the rate of change of current, so that's the thing that creates the talking. If you, if you change the current in the circuit, that's going to cause the circuit to start talking to neighbors or itself. So it's the proportionality constant between the um, uh, rate of change of current and the, the uh, over here on the right-hand side, the uh, corresponding change in flux, rate of change of flux through the circuit. And so a circuit that has a large self-inductance, what that really means is it, it, it kind of talks to itself a lot. A changing current in that circuit with a large self-inductance will create a large changing flux and create a large induced current, a large induced EMF. A, a circuit with a um, small self-inductance, you change the current in that, that circuit with the small self-inductance, it, it won't change, it, the flux won't change very much. Uh, and therefore, you won't induce much EMF, won't induce very large in induced voltages. Um, whether a circuit has a large self-inductance or a small self-inductance depends on how the circuit is laid out, how the circuit is arranged. depends on the geometry and the components of the circuit. You know, I might have a large self-inductance uh, that would reflect that, you know, I talk to myself a lot at home. You might have a small self-inductance. You tend not to talk to yourself very much at home. So it's the same thing for circuits. What large or small self-inductance is describing, the degree to which all circuits talk to themselves at some, some degree, but degree, the amount to which a circuit communicates with itself, induces EMFs, induces currents in itself. Okay, I've got a demonstration of this. I've gone from, as pointed out, I've gone from the, the largest demonstration we have uh, to absolute smallest demonstration, this little guy here. So I'm going to have to put this on the, on the camera.
Okay, now I've got to find it and expand it. This should only, don't worry, this should only take me 20 minutes. No, wrong way. Okay, that's a relief. Um, on this on this bench here, I've really got a, a single circuit. The single circuit comprises um, a coil of wire, this solenoid here. So this is a coil of wire a lamp, the lamp is up here, uh, a battery, the battery is, is in here. It, this is a little box in which the battery is. It's just a regular kind of uh, nine volt battery um, from a smoke detector. Um, and then there's a switch. So just four components in the circuit, very s simple circuit. And they're just arranged with the battery, the switch, the coil, the lamp. Um, if I was to close the switch, and so I, I close the switch by pushing down here, uh, then the circuit is complete. So current would flow from the battery, through the switch, through the coil, and through the lamp. But you might notice, I'm going to turn the lights out now. Um, I'm going to turn the lights out so you can see the lamp. <laughs> Where are the lights? I close that switch again. So the circuit is complete now. You can't see anything because my hands there. Circuit is complete now, uh, but the lamp's not lit. Well, that's that's kind of curious. Not a very useful circuit. Um, I, I've wired up a circuit uh, with a battery, with a switch, uh, and a lamp, and the lamp doesn't work. Well, the reason the lamp doesn't work is that this battery is a is a nine volt lamp. Is a nine volt. This battery is a 9 volt battery, so it provides 9 volts. This lamp requires 60 volts. So I've connected up a 60 volt uh, lamp to a 9 volt battery. Well, of course it's not going to work. Uh, but the reason we did it is there is actually a moment that it does work. I'm going to release the switch, and if you look up at the lamp, maybe you'll see, do you see it flash? If I put the switch on, it flashes. So every time I turn off or on the circuit, for that moment, for that instant, there's a flash in the lamp. So at that moment, there must be, when the circuit's switched on, or when the circuit switched off, there must somehow be 60 volts in the circuit. But I've only got a 9 volt battery in the circuit. Where does the 60 volts in the circuit come from? The 60 volts in the circuit is not from the 9 volt battery. 60 volts in the circuit is from the, um, is an induced voltage, is an induced current that's created by the coil. So when I change the current and the voltage across the coil, that's changing the magnetic field, the magnetic flux through the coil, that changing magnetic field, changing magnetic flux through the coil creates an induced EMF across the coil, an induced current through the coil, and that's what lights this, the 60 volt battery. So we're, we're able through induction, for induced currents, induced EMFs, to light a 60 volt battery, uh, light a 60 volt uh, lamp with a 9 volt battery. Okay.
This question asks, uh, is basically an example of self-inductance. Oh. Yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing now. Just kind of panicking, thinking about running out the back door. Here we are. OK. We just looked at a demonstration of, of self-inductance. In, self in one circuit, create an induced EMF, create an induced current through um, uh, through a, a, a change in the circuit, switching on and off the circuit. Uh, and here's just a little example of, um, of self-inductance. Uh, so in this example, we've got a 24 millivolt, we're told that a 24 millivolt EMF is generated in a 500 turn coil for a rate of change of current that's 10 amps. And from that information, we're going to calculate the, the coil self-inductance. So this is an example, a quantitative example, of working with, um, with, with self-inductance. So I think I'll, I'll do this one on the um, document camera, which means I've got to do something. Here we are. I'll just shift this little guy up. Um, we said that the inductance was defined as the proportionality constant between the rate at which current is changing, so that's di dt, and the uh, rate at which the flux through the circuit is changing. That's uh, d phi dt. So this is a definition, if you can read it, um, of inductance, self-inductance L. Well, this rate of change of flux, that is simply the EMF, the induced EMF in the circuit. In this particular problem, we're told the induced EMF in the circuit, so we're told it's 24 millivolts. Uh, we're told the rate of change of the current in the circuit. Uh, that's 10 amps per second. Uh, so we're told in this problem, this guy over here, we're told in this problem, this guy here, and we're asked to figure out the self-inductance. So all we've got to do is work with this equation in which we define the self-inductance to figure out what the self-inductance of this circuit is. And so all I'm going to do here is, um, is rearrange this, that the self-inductance L is just the ratio of the rate of change of flux, or the EMF. I'm going to write it as the EMF because we were told the EMF divided by the uh, rate of change of current. So this is really the cause of the effect in the denominator, the fact that we change the current, and the, um, the result of the effect, the induced EMF, or the change in flux, in the numerator. And self-inductance is the ratio of those two things. So that's how we're going to calculate the self-inductance. Um, so just to fill in the numbers, we've got a uh, EMF that was uh, 24 millivolts, so 0 0.024, what am I doing? I didn't take my medication this morning, I think that's what it is. 0 0.024 volts divided by, what was our changing changing current. It was 10 amps per second. And if I divide 0 0.024 by, by 10, uh, that's um, 0 0.0024, uh, or 2.4 milli. And the units of inductance, another strange name, they're Henry's. Remember Henry? 
Remember, he was just beat by Faraday in discovering the law of induction, booby prize. He's got the, um, uh, he's got the units of inductance. Uh, so uh, 2.4 millihenries is the answer to this problem. Uh, notice there was a red herring in this question. Uh, a red herring is the 500 turns of the coil. It's, it's irrelevant. We didn't need to use it to calculate the self-inductance in this example. Okay. Where am I going? I wanted to draw a analogy between something we talked about in the past, capacitors, uh, and something that we're talking about now, inductors, um, and capacitant, the analogy, corresponding analogy between capacitance describing a capacitor and inductance describing an inductance. So that's what this, this slide is to introduce. Um, if we place a charge on a capacitor, we charge up a capacitor, you create a voltage between the plates of the capacitor. That's what a capacitor is. And the amount of voltage that is created by the amount of charge that you store, the, the proportionality between them is determined by the capacitance of the capacitor, C. So there's a similar thing with inductors. If you um, pass a current through um, a inductor, like a coil or a solenoid or a loop of wire, uh, that creates a um, magnetic flux through the inductor, just like um, placing a charge created a voltage on the capacitor. So uh, the analogy is that driving the current through the inductor creates a flux through the inductor. Uh, the proportionality constant between the uh, in inductance, sorry, the flux that you've created and the current that you drove to create it, that is the inductance. So inductance is an analogy to capacitance. Uh, and so upstairs here, this was the old master. I'm sorry, this thing's getting so faint now. Oh, it's warming up. <laughs> uh, this is the master equation for a capacitor, which relates kind of the cause and effect, the charge being applied, the voltage appearing. And, and again, this is this definition of inductance is really the, the master equation for self-inductance. It is a proportionality constant between uh, cause and effect. The, the cause is a current. Uh, the, the resulting effect is the, the magnetic flux. Now, I, I wanted to introduce that because um, when we talked about capacitors, we talked about a very sort of important famous geometry of capacitors, which was a parallel plate capacitor. And, and for the parallel plate capacitor, the special thing about it is because of the very simple geometry, um, you can write an equation for the capacitance of the capacitor in terms of the um, geometry of the capacitor. It was this equation upstairs here. If you remember, the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor depended on the area of the plates. It depended on the separations between the plates. That's, that's all about the geometry of the capacitor. More area was more capacitance. Bigger separation was less capacitance. Um, the analogy to a parallel plate capacitor is a, is a solenoidal inductor, an inductor that looks like a sequence of um, uh, coils like this, uh, um, a, a long solenoid. Uh, it's analogous because like in the um, parallel plate capacitor, there's a simple electrical field between the plates, just a nice uniform field. In this solenoidal inductor, there's a nice simple field between the windings. It's just a uniform magnetic field of the solenoid. Um, the inductance of a, a solenoidal inductor, so L, is given by this little equation here. It depends on the geometry. Um, and it you, in this equation here, you see the cross-sectional area of the inductor, that's the A, and you see the length of the inductor, that's the, the L here, and you see the number of turns per unit length of the inductor, that's the little lowercase n here. 
And so this is a second analogy that there are parallel plate capacitors where it's straightforward to write down an equation describing the capacitance of the capacitor. Likewise, there's solenoidal inductors where it's straightforward to write down an equation that describes the inductance of the inductor in terms of its geometry. Here's just an application of that um, equation for the inductance of an inductor, a solenoidal inductor. Uh, we wrote it this way, that the inductance is mu naught times the number of turns per unit length squared uh, times the area of the, the cross-section of the inductor times the length. That's, that's one way you can write it. There's a second way you can write it. It's equivalent, where uh, instead of lowercase n, that's the turns per unit length, you actually write the number of turns. So the uppercase n is simply the number of turns. If you write it that way, instead of multiplying by the length of the solenoid, you have to divide by the length of the solenoid. Look, these aren't two different equations little n is just n over L. And so this equation comes from this equation. The one on the right comes from the one on the left just by substituting little n equals big N over L. And sometimes one is handier, sometimes the other is handier. Um, here's just an illustration, an example of using it. This is the self-inductance. I'm calculating the self-inductance of this particular inductor that's described here. It's an inductor that has... Is in the form of the solenoid, so solenoid in inductor, I can use this equation, that's the first thing. It has 200 turns, so we've wrapped 200 coils of wire in our solenoid. It has a length that's 5 centimeters, something like this. Uh, it has a cross-section that's 4 square meters, so maybe it's this sort of big in cross-section. And based on that information, we're being told the geometry of the inductor, the number of turns of the inductor, we can figure out the inductance of the inductor, which tells us how weakly or strongly it talks to itself. And so I've just computed that. Here's, here's mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Tesla's meters over amps. Here's the square of the number of turns. Here's the cross-sectional area in square meters. It had a... Um, uh, a cross-section of 4 square centimeters, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters. And here's the length. It had a length of 5 centimeters, 0 0.05 meters. And if you calculate this, you get this sum. 4 tenths of a millihenry. Okay. Wanted to move on to talk about <clears throat> another couple of equations. They actually parallel two previous equations. These equations are, I'm going to show you here about um, energizing and de-energizing an inductor and how the current flows or, or stops flowing when you energize or de-energize an inductor. And this will resemble, this will look just like when we talked about how you um, energize and de-energize a capacitor, when you charge up, discharge a capacitor and how the, um, the current flows onto and on or off the capacitor. In both cases, when you energize an in inductor or de-energize an inductor, what I mean by energizing and de-energizing, I, I mean is when I, I switch on the current in the inductor or switch off the current in the inductor. That current doesn't instantaneously start flowing it doesn't instantaneously stop flowing. It takes a little time to build up and flow. It takes a little time to cease its flow. So that there's some characteristic time scale at which the current builds up when you energize an inductor, uh, some characteristic time scale that the current falls off when you de-energize an inductor, when you switch them on and off. It's exactly the same for capacitors. When we charged up a capacitor, um, the charge didn't appear immediately. When you discharge the capacitor, the charge didn't disappear immediately. It took some time, some characteristic time, for the charge to build up. It takes some characteristic charge for the charge to decay away. And so there's a time constant there too. So uh, these slides will be familiar 
because these are recycled slides. They're recycled slides from the energizing, de-energizing a capacitor to de-energizing and energizing of an inductor. And so we're just replacing capacitors with inductors. Um, and we're replacing um, charging up with driving a current. We're replacing uh, creating a voltage on a, between the place of a capacitor with um, creating a magnetic flux through the windings of a inductor. So this is the energizing case. So how, how, how do, what is energizing an inductor? It's really described in this sketch here on the left. This is a circuit that contains a battery, a switch, a inductor, and a resistor. So these four components. It's exactly the circuit over here, it was, where the bulb is a resistor. So it's exactly that circuit. When I close the switch, I complete the circuit. And the important point is, when I close the switch, well, initially, the current is zero. Ultimately, after the switch has been closed a long while, the current will be determined just by the EMF of the battery and the resistance of the resistor according to Ohm's law. So the current will eventually be the voltage of the battery divided by the resistance of the resistor. That's Ohm's law. So we'll get that current. But it doesn't go from open switch to closed switch, from no current to full current in zero time. It takes some time interval. And I'm going to show you the equation that describes that buildup of the current. It's this equation here. So upstairs here is the formula for the current in that circuit. When you've closed the switch, you've completed the switch at time zero. When you close the switch, complete complete the circuit at time zero, this is the current that flows in the circuit as a function of time. So there's time over here on the right hand side. This is a function of time, that's why there's time in parentheses here. And uh, this formula describes the functional dependence of the, uh, the, the current. Uh, that formula is sketched down here. So this is a sketch of this equation. Horizontally is the time, that's what the equation is a function of. Vertically is the current. That's what the function is describing. So we've got current vertically, time horizontally. In red here, this is the current building up from zero. It was zero current when the switch was open to a full current that's determined by the battery and the resistor. It's determined by Ohm's law. So here's the current building up. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a exponentially shaped curve exponentially crawling up towards the full current. That's what this equation is describing. And importantly, the time constant is set by the components in the circuit. The time constant for this buildup of the current is determined by the ratio of the inductance to the resistance, this L over R. And so the bigger this ratio is of the inductance of the inductor to the resistance of the resistor, the longer it will take the current to build up in the circuit. The smaller that ratio is of the inductance to the uh, resistance, then the smaller ratio that current will switch on more quickly, will build up more quickly. And that ratio is called the time constant. And we met that ratio in resistor capacitor circuits too. Here's the, say, here's the opposite case when we de-energize, when we de-energize a inductor. So in, in this circuit here, we start with the switch being in position A. If the switch is in position A, then again, we've got a circuit with a battery, a switch that's closed, a resistor and an inductor. So it's again a complete circuit with a, a battery, resistor, inductor and switch is exactly this circuit uh, over here. So this is a circuit where the inductor is energized. There is current flowing around the circuit, uh, just steadily flowing around the circuit. That current's causing a flux through the inductor 
Um, and uh, that inductor is energized. It has a magnetic field in it. Now we're going to de-energize it. How do we de-energize it? This is how you do it. You have this kind of um, switch where you can move it from this terminal here where the circuit contains the battery to this terminal here, B, where the circuit doesn't contain the battery. You turned, we've removed the battery from the circuit. When you remove the battery from the circuit, there's nothing to drive the current. Does the current fall off immediately, instantaneously, at that moment? No. It takes an interval, it takes a period of time to fall away. It falls away gradually with a time constant. And so I'm just going to show you the equation that describes the um, decrease in the current when you de-energize the inductor. So this is now de-energizing the inductor. Upstairs here is the formula that describes the de-energizing of the inductor. And, and downstairs here is a sketch of that, that formula. So if you look at the formula again, it's kind of like the, the previous formula for energizing, um, in that it um, describes the current, I, as a function of time. That's why time's in parentheses here. Over on the right-hand side, um, we said it was a, uh, the current as a function of time. So we see the time variable here. That's the T. And the equation describes how the current varies with the variable time. It's this little equation here. Again, it involves an exponential function. Uh, I naught is the initial current in this case. It was the final current in the previous case. It's the current when the inductor is energized. So it's, here is the initial current. Previously, it was the final current. So this is the formula describing the de-energizing of an inductor. And this is a picture of that equation. It's a sketch of that equation. Um, uh, time is horizontal. So the variable time, the independent variable, that's horizontal. The current, that's vertical. That's the dependent variable. That's plotted vertically. So we're plotting current vertically versus time horizontally. We see at time zero, the moment that we flip the switch from position A to position B, we see at that moment the current was the full current in the inductor, and it's going to fall off. But we don't see it fall off immediately, instantaneously. Rather, it decays away, and it decays away exponentially according to an exponential function, just like it climbed up exponentially according to an exponential function. Um, and, and we're seeing that here in this red line. And again, there's a time constant associated with this fall off. We call that time constant tau. And again, it's, um, it's given by the ratio of the inductance to the inductor, uh, inductance to the resistance in the circuit. So, not only, if you have a large ratio, not only does it take a, a, a length, longer time to energize the circuit, but if you have a large ratio of L over R, it takes a long time to de-energize the circuit. If you have a small ratio of L to R, then um, it, if you've got a small ratio, it's quick to energize the circuit. It's also quick to de-energize the circuit. The whole reason that it takes some time to energize a circuit or de-energize a circuit. Why, why, does it, why is this so, you might be saying? Why, why does it take some time to energize it or de-energize it? What's going on? The, what's going on is induction. The moment you close the switch, the moment you o open the switch, there's not only, you've, you've not just uh, you know, added a battery into the circuit or removed the battery from the circuit. You've done something else. There's another source of induced EMF, induced current. In addition to the battery, when you close or open the switch, you're inducing EMFs, inducing currents in the coil. And those, those oppose the change. Remember, they always pose the change. So they're opposing you switching on the current. They're opposing you switching off the current. And that's why it takes some time for the current to climb up this time constant, L over R, takes some time for the current to fall off, this time constant, L over R. So that's the, that's the explanation for it. That's the reason for it. Um, I'm going to skip this one. It's just an example. You might wonder, and maybe you wondered this for, um, uh, uh, for capacitors. You know, why could it be that um, RC, the product of resistance and capacitor, is a time? How could that possibly be? That's ohms 
times Farad. And you might wonder, how could it be? How could it possibly be, it must be wrong, that L over R, inductance over resistance, is a time? Because all of those things, the, the R, the L, what's the final one? The C, right? The, the, the Farads, the Henrys, and the Ohms, they're all about circuit components. So how can you take ratios of products of them and get time? They, those ratios, or those products, RC, L, L over R, does have the units of time. Does have the units of time. You can figure it out if you take the, those master equations for R, C, and L. So one of them would be Ohm's law, V equals IR. Another one would be the definition of capacitance, Q over V. Another one would be the definition of inductance as phi over, uh, phi over I, current over, sorry, flux over current. If you take those master equations and write out the units in full, you discover that the ratio L over R, or the product RC, has units of time. So it's really amazing to see how that comes out. And that's why those, those products or ratios are the time constants of these circuits. Okay, last topic. I've got to show you one, one or two slides here. Okay, remember that when we talked about capacitors, we, we sort of started thinking about them as storing charge, but they're also storing energy. They're really storing charge and energy. And in circuits, they're often used to store charge or energy, depending on their job in an electrical circuit. Um, for inductors, too. We've talked about them as um, kind of um, uh, creating flux uh, when you drive the current through the circuit. So they're making flux. But you can also think of them, likewise, as storing energy. So when we think of uh, inductors in circuits, they're often playing the role of manufacturing flux or storing energy. Um, so there's an equation for a capacitor. We met it before. I wrote one version of the equation upstairs here. Uh, for the energy stored in a capacitor. And there's a partner equation for the energy stored in an inductor. It's this equation down here. Uh, the energy stored in a capacitor is one-half CV squared. That's one way of writing it. You might remember there's three different ways you can write it. You can replace the uh, V with the charge. Uh, you can replace the C with charge. So there's three different ways you can write it using C equals Q over V. Same idea down here. Here's one way of writing the um, energy that's stored in an inductor. Uh, it's one half L I squared. Look at, really look at the parallel um, between the two. Um, uh, now it's involving the current rather than the voltage. Now it's involving the inductance rather than the capacitance. But you've still got this one half factor here. And again, you can write this equation in three different ways, using the, the, that master equation for an inductor, that the inductance L equals the flux over the inductance. So this could be written in three different ways. This example here is just the um, energy. We're asked to just calculate the energy stored in an inductor and the inductance of that inductor. Actually, first we calculate the inductance, and then we're going to calculate the energy that that would store for a certain current. And so this is an example of um, that equation. I've run out of time. That's why I'm not going to go through it. Um, but I, I um, uh, invite you to look, look at it after class. Uh, uh, this is an example of calculating the in the energy stored in an inductor in terms of the current that's flowing in the inductor and the inductance of the inductor, just like you've done for capacitors. Look, the whole of today's class, just to summarize, is about one of these two effects contained in Faraday's law. It's the effect, the phenomena, that governs wireless communication. We're constantly using wireless communication. You're all using it. I'm using it in class today. You know, you might be at the back shopping online. Uh, 